We are going to present uh, our approach for building a dynamic slave cloud for Jenkins with Apache Mesos. And we are Klaus Atzesberger, and my name is Reinhard Kieswetter. We both work in a small team at Infonova, which is a software development and consulting company based in Austria. And our team is responsible for maintaining and innovating the continuous integration and continuous development, development at our company. And what we expect you now is that first we're going to give you some numbers about our Jenkins environment, how it looked like before we used dynamic slaves, uh, the reasons why we choose, uh, chose to go dynamic, and all the reasons why we think that other people should use a dynamic slave cloud. Uh, we are going to tell you what pains we experienced with our static slaves, and if the network connectivity is going to work, we will show you on a live demo how easy it is to set up such a cloud, and we are going to show you some common ops use cases with a dynamic cloud. If the network connectivity fails on us, we prepared some screencasts, so we will see uh, a semi-live demo if our network fails. Uh, we have to admit that the solution is not entirely brand new, and our kudos go to Why Not Cone for publishing the Mesos Cloud Jenkins plugin to the community and to the eBay platform as a service team for sharing their solution on this topic in great detail. Um, our Jenkins environment is used by roughly 300 developers working on-site and offshore. We host jobs for about 35 projects, increasing, and up to date we um, have about 2,500 configured jobs. And we decided to have one central Jenkins master to rule all these jobs. And as you might think, it's pretty tough and it's not an option to have a downtime for maintenance. So we had to figure out how we, which features we needed for such a centralized approach and we decided to make our Jenkins master high available to our engi engineers and developers and have a maintenance window without a downtime. We realized this by uh, implementing a blue-green deployment of a new Jenkins master, which gives us the possibility to have a 100% reliable pre-prod environment and to uh, roll back the changes we made in case the changes destroy anything. Um, the first approach, we tried to achieve build isolation by hosting our slaves on reused virtual machines. And we're going to tell you why this was not the best idea as we know now. Um, since you're here, I guess you ask yourself why you should adopt to our approach. And I can guarantee you one of the first questions if you go back to your company, your managers might ask, what is it going to cost us? So the costs of changing your slave cloud are null in terms of hardware, because you can reuse your existing one. And also, if you don't experience such a load on your Jenkins master like we do, you can benefit from this approach because as we will hopefully demonstrate it, the use of your hardware, hardware scales much better with a dynamic approach. Um, we want to be honest with you, setting up such a cloud uh, is quite a task, so it helps if you have some sysadmin background or at least know some basic Linux administration commands. Now again, what do we want to build? We want to build uh, a unified, single scalable hardware resource pool, which Mesos enables us to do. And we want to use it to run any kind of slave in any size. So our slave should be instantly available 
and as lightweight as possible. So we realized our slaves as Docker containers and Docker images. Uh, what are you going to need to realize a dynamic slave cloud? Well, first of all, the Jenkins Mesos plugin. It's quite obvious. And this is also the easiest part of installation. Uh, you take the HPI, go to your web interface of Jenkins, and there it is. The difficult part would be setting up the Mesos master cluster, which in our case is backed up with Zookeeper. Uh, for those of you who don't know Zookeeper, Zookeeper is a tool for managing distributed services. Our Mesos slaves, as I said, they are um, also realized as Docker containers. Same is true for the Jenkins slaves. Uh, we decided to use QRS as a lightweight operating system to host our Docker containers as it provides us with a mature upgrade mechanism and has a stable upstream. And we figured out that we need some proper monitoring for our Jenkins slaves to give us the possibility for uh, a real capacity planning and to report the usage of the projects on our infrastructure. So we are going to concentrate on this part for the rest of our presentation. What are the problems with the static approach? Why did we change? Um, we found out that managing slave instances is quite a time consuming and often nerve wracking piece of work. First of all, you have to install each node. You have to update and version each node because not all your projects are going to need the same version of a tool at the same time. That's why you have to maintain some sort of backward compatibility. And static slave uh, have the biggest drawback that they carry a history, that they have a state, which means that once a build run on a slave, this build leaves its traces and possibly breaks the environment for the next build running on the same slave machine. So we first decided that we have to balance our labels. So different labels here represent different types of Jenkins slaves. Maybe one slave is responsible, a slave type is responsible for executing Maven builds. Next type is responsible for performing some GUI tests or some graphical user interface tests. The next test has some tools installed to deploy your SQL scripts or so on. This static approach works out quite okay as long as your build queue matches your hardware distribution. But like we experienced, there are different jobs running during business hours than during the night hours. Or if a project is on hold and another project is being pushed forward, your build queue might look quite different. And now our slave distribution is not so matching our build queue, which means there are jobs waiting for execution slots. And on the other hand, we have slaves in an idle state because they either have the wrong size or they have the wrong tools installed. Another disadvantage of having static slaves is that you have to make a trade-off between the waste of the resources when it comes to CPU and memory on the slave hardware, because you either make bigger slaves and waste those resources on smaller builds, or B, you make um, smaller slaves and by this prolong or endanger the builds for the bigger projects. So with this background, having to set up an environment like this started looking quite appealing to us. And for the setup of the Mesos, I'm going to hand over to Klaus. Thank you very much, Reinhard. <laughs> um, <coughs> so I'm here to explain you the details of our setup and how you can do it the same. Um, first of all, uh, I need to tell you some, uh, give you some context about Mesos itself. The job of Mesos in this setup is uh, to provide us with a common single resource pool of hardware. So we have different um, machines uh, we want to reuse and we want also to have uh, the possibility to scale out easily. 
So Mesos gives us the chance, or it provides us with the possibility to take one machine, put it into our cloud, and uh, we talk to all this hardware as one single pool of resources, of hardware resources. So uh, some further Mesos context. Uh, in the Mesos world, uh, you will encounter some uh, definitions like uh, framework. A framework uh, consists uh, of a scheduler and an executor. The scheduler is somewhat uh, the client uh, in, in this uh, setup, and it is responsible to launch tasks. Uh, the executor uh, in, executes the task and uh, is launched by the Mesos slave. So uh, on this slide, you can see the major parts of such a setup with, in, with Jenkins. So on the top tier, we have the Jenkins master with a plugin installed. And the middle tier is uh, the master cluster of the Mesos master. Uh, there is only one master actively working. The other masters of Mesos, the other masters in this cluster, are standing actively by. So if the middle one drops out, or the active one drops out, uh, the, the other masters do some election, and uh, the new elected Mesos master picks up the work again, and. Uh, nobody actually uh, senses that uh, there was a problem on your Mesos cloud. So the bottom tier is the Mesos slaves, uh, which in turn uh, start the Docker executors. And on these Docker executors, uh, we run the, uh, the Docker executor runs this task. In our case, it's the Jenkins slave, which the task is. A task in Mesos is uh, an abstract concept uh, which defines how much resources I need from the Mesos cloud, which in turn is responsible to provide us a single pool resource uh, of, of hardware resources. So in a bit more detail again, uh, we look at the Jenkins master at the uh, top right corner. The Jenkins master has a job queue and some of these jobs uh, are uh, configured to run on our Mesos cloud. Uh, so the Mesos plugin hooks in at the cloud API provided by the Jenkins core. And uh, over this cloud API, it gets notified whether or not there is a job waiting for uh, ex execution on the Mesos cloud. So when we start a job uh, to be run on the Mesos cloud, Jenkins Mesos plugin gets notified, and the scheduler within this Jenkins Mesos plugin then creates a task, which in our case is the Jenkins slave task. Up to now, it, there is no process actually running for the Jenkins slave. We only have this abstract uh, task defining how much resources we uh, want to have uh, or want to acquire uh, from the Mesos resource pool. So um, this task gets handed over to the Mesos master, and there is some handshaking with the Mesos slaves, um, and the Mesos slave sends some offers of resources uh, to the scheduler, and the scheduler accepts one of, one of these resource offers and declines all the other resource offers, and once this happens, this task gets executed on the Mesos slave whose offer got accepted. So now we actually start a process on one of these Mesos slaves. And uh, this process uh, is pretty plain, uh, is a pretty plain uh, slave char running. And from there on, uh, you already know the technology. Uh, the slave char communicates via the plain JNLP protocol with the master and says, hello there, I'm a new slave, and you can run jobs on, on my executor. So the job which initially uh, started this uh, queue of events uh, gets handed over to the newly started uh, Jenkins slave, which is executed on the Mesos slave in the cloud. <coughs> um, after the job is terminated, uh, 
the meso slave is idle, and after some idle time, this meso slave uh, gets terminated itself, and the resources are freed again. So um, we have one last, one last missing piece in our setup, the operating system. Uh, we need some operating system running our Docker containers, and we wanted this layer to be as lightweight as possible and as stable as possible. Um, and therefore, we decided to use Core OS. You can actually run this Meso setup on many other distributions of Linux as well. You can use CentOS, Ubuntu, whatever your flavor is. And it would perfectly work uh, too. But we decided as for Core OS uh, for a named reason, like the major uh, auto update mechanism, which is very, very fancy. Uh, the only thing you need to manage is uh, to make sure that all your services you run on this cluster uh, are resilient to, um, to dropouts of, of single nodes of your cluster. So if one node gets auto-updated, you need to make sure all these services can uh, shut down uh, gracefully and no slave gets interrupted with its work. Um, so those are some very good benefits and some very good reasons to use CoreOS, in my opinion. Um, yeah, um, as you can see, there is um, this is the, an image from from uh, the CoreOS page itself. Uh, the blue squares are uh, showing some slots on this operating system where you can run Docker containers and. Um, Right now, this core S node runs a Mesos master and a Mesos slave. And once this is up and running, uh, this slave can be used by this uh, cloud, and in turn, the Jenkins master, which in turn can uh, run slaves on this uh, slave. So when this happens, uh, several Docker containers can be started via the Mesos cloud API. Um, there can be slaves of different sizes, so um, just as like, uh, just as you configure it on on your Mesos cloud configuration, as you can see in the demo uh, later on. <coughs> so sharing is caring. Uh, we wanted to uh, make sure uh, every one of you can. Uh, go out of this room and uh, set up this uh, cloud yourself. And for this reason, we uh, pushed uh, parts, the most parts of our setup as, as it is uh, into the GitHub. Uh, and yeah, uh, it's public repository. Feel free to try it out. <coughs> Uh, the code with, uh, within these repositories is our actual uh, Ansible playbooks. I don't know which of you already know Ansible. Okay, not that much, too. <laughs> uh, Ansible is somewhat uh, like Puppet, which should uh, be known by more of you, or like Chef. It's a provisioning tool um, which gives you uh, the possibility to automate stuff. Uh, Ansible, in short, um, you can automate setups of whatever you want. Uh, you can automate maintenance uh, tasks like online maintenance windows. Uh, so you can uh, automatically update one cluster node after another, for example. You can do pretty much everything with it in terms of automation. Uh, you also can execute commands on a set of hosts if you um, if you are playing the fire guard and, and you uh, desperately uh, need to execute some commands on certain hosts of your environment, you can do this with this uh, tool uh, and it saves you a lot of time. Uh, Ansible is based on Python and SSH and you write playbooks uh, in YAML syntax. So it is easy to read. And yeah, it's, it's kind of the flavor these, flavor these days to configure stuff in YAML. Um, uh, further adv advantage of uh, Ansible is that it's, uh, it runs with, without any agents. So 
it is plain Python and SSH and you have rather zero dependencies. Yeah. So let's come to the demo. Um, we have three use cases prepared, um, which are pretty common in our opinion, uh, maintaining and, and running such a setup. The first uh, use case is to scale out the hardware. So if you happen to know, okay, we don't have enough power anymore, or we, or we have uh, the requirement to double our uh, builds, then you have to buy hardware. And to integrate this hardware, it is pretty simple. Uh, you run an Ansible playbook we already provided on GitHub, and that's it. The second use case is um, you want to update software that is pre-installed on your Jenkins slave images. The Jenkins slave images are managed by Docker, or as Docker images, so you want to pre-bake them. You want to install JDKs, you want to pre-install Maven and whatever. In our case, we demonstrated with a Firefox uh, installation uh, used by some Selenium tests. And the third use case is uh, you can change the sizing of some slaves and um, you do it by configuring several labels uh, for, Mesos, for the Mesos cloud using the same Docker image, but different resource configurations. So you can actually use the same Docker image with different labels, uh, which are configured with different resource requirements and uh, thus uh, start different, uh, different sized slave images of the same image. So if you happen to have some tests uh, which are rather memory hungry, then you can do so by just adding a, um, a further label with more memory. Um, yeah, that's about the use cases. Uh, So the first use case is to scale out uh, uh, the hardware. Um, I provided this uh, a, a short video because uh, the provisioning of such a of, of such a Mesos instance on CoreOS um, needs quite some bit of time, and. Uh, here you see the, the user interface of Mesos, and at the bottom left corner you see the resources provided by the Mesos cloud. Um, you can see the total CPUs and memory that are provided, and you can see how much of this is already in use. Um, then on the slaves tab you can see uh, which cluster nodes are online and registered. On, on this Mesos cloud. So these are actual uh, the Mesos slaves registering, uh, registered on the master cluster. And you can see how much resources they provide to your cloud. Uh, you, can see, you can see too um, when they actually registered to this cloud. And here uh, I opened the virtual machine manager of Ubuntu. Uh, which shows how many instances are running right now. Um, so and what I'm about to do now is I'm uh, provisioning a fourth node. Um, I'm opening a playbook, um, which does this task for me. Uh, so at the top, you can see the, the machines which are provisioned by this playbook. Uh, the dev Mesos nodes one to four are currently configured. So actually when I run this playbook, it will check uh, all these nodes, whether there is already everything configured and up and running for uh, servicing our Mesos cloud. Uh, and if it is not, it installs and starts every needed service. <coughs> So when we are running this playbook, uh, we can watch um, we can watch it uh, what the 
the states change, which states are changing uh, on the different nodes. Uh, and that's it's not now. It's the reason uh, I'm I'm spinning forward. Uh, a bit too quick. So here you can see uh, we have um, the execution on the different nodes is in parallel. So uh, we have three three times okay. The first three nodes already were started, and we have to do nothing. And on the fourth node, we have a changed state. So this playbook actually did something on the fourth node. And there are several tasks to do to set up such a, a node. And um, yeah, this does its work. And after it's done, uh, we see in the back we have this fourth node. I hope you can see my cursor. And we should see it uh, in the Mesosquare that there is more resources available now. So yeah, we look at the bottom left corner. We have now four CPUs and two gigabytes of memory available. And now uh, these resources are available to the Jenkins master running the Jenkins Mesos plugin. <coughs> I will now show you how you can use these resources within your Jenkins. And since I think the network uh, let us down, I too have to use our screencasts. So what I'm going to show you now is how we deal with changing the version of a Firefox on our Firefox slaves. And this would be the same use case we take for backwards compatibility if a project still needs an older version. We just use the old Docker image, as you will see later. Um, no? Yes? Uh -huh. Yes. So here's um, the central. Jenkins configuration, we just scroll down to the cloud uh, configuration. This is actually a configuration point provided as soon as you install the Mesos plugin. What you see under the point Mesos Masters is actually the zookeeper URL of our master cluster. And the next stop, I'm just going to make this a little bit different. So here you can see the different labels you can configure. Uh, and for each label, you can define different uh, re required resources. So you can define how much, how much memory a job that actually runs on this label uh, needs and how much CPU. So this here is the trick. Here you define the name of the label. In our case, this was Mesos Selenium. Yes? Can you zoom in? I'm not sure if this player can zoom in. Is the echte funktioniert der? I can probably show it Gibt's ein Freund, oder? Oder? on a local ja. Jenkins. Ich muss nur zoomen. Here we see our label configuration. So each job later on tied to this label will use a dynamic slave. And when it comes to the point of resources, 
You will see here that you have the CPU uh, allocation for this slave as well as the memory. And a little bit further down, again hidden behind an advanced button, we see that we use a Docker image, which in our case comes from our local Docker registry. And if we take a look at our job configuration, here we meet again our label. So this job is going to be executed on a dynamic slave. And if everything works out fine, uh, we see here a unique ID. So this slave is also available. And on our hey, Mesos master, we meet our ID again. And as you can see here, these are the allocated resources for these jobs, which add up exactly to the one from the configuration for this slave. And if we take a look at the output, uh, take some time to speed it up. Maybe I'll show you one from before. Uh, we simply printed our Firefox version, Mozilla Firefox 31, which is the one packed with our Docker image. And what we prepared, and which is also available on GitHub, is a project to build our own Docker images for Jenkins slaves. And we have prepared something there as well. And I'm just going to change the configuration. Again, we are in the, ah, you can see my finger, in the Mesos cloud. The same label. I'm actually doing a downgrade right now. Because I'm going to use an older image, so the Firefox version is going to be a lower one. And I can do this during the job is running because this slave already got provisioned. It uses another Docker image, absolutely no influence on this one. And if I'm going to start the job again, whoop -de -whoop, and you can go away. These are the benefits of a live demo, and I'll see <laughs> that if, if it's made with a hot needle, it not always works as expected. But if this job gets executed, we would actually see the all the Firefox version. And if we want to provide one project with Firefox version A and another project with Firefox version B, all you have to do is configure a second label and therefore use um, the other Docker image. Very similar to this, we again go to our configuration pane. And if, for instance, a project decides oops, that it wants to execute GUI testing with parallel tests on the same slave, And they need more resources, 
All I need to do is change the allocation of CPU and memory, uh, create a new label for it, maybe mention in the label that this one uses now one gigabyte of memory or two CPU cores, and the next project can use the same Docker image with more resources for their tests. What we would like to show you now is how we did our migration from the static slave to the dynamic slaves. Thank you. Um, like before, this was our uh, hard allocated, uh, static allocated hardware. We had about four labels, different tools, different sizes. As you said before, if a build queue like this comes along, everything is going to work out fine. And what we did is we replaced a couple of static slaves with our core as nodes, which are able to execute dynamic slaves. So during the business hours, there were a lot of jobs configured for the green label and a couple for the red label. These slaves actually could be of different sizes, of course, like we mentioned before. And during night times, a lot of automated grid testing is going on in our company, so the allocation of the dynamic slaves might be looking something like this. And what are our lessons learned for changing from a static slave approach to a dynamic slave approach is when you configure your system D services, keep in mind that your core S nodes are actually performing an auto update and turn those services off. So make sure that your services and running Jenkins slaves are resilient to this. Oops. Um, when you build your Docker containers for your Jenkins slaves, respect your own local time zone and character encoding settings because there are project teams that don't react too well if their tests don't get executed because their slave is suddenly in another time zone or if their encoding isn't working. And you should do a soft project migration, meaning take a project where you know that there are progressive developers who like to be on the bleeding edge of your technology and who are able to analyze or pre-analyze the problems and probably come back with some meaningful feedback, as this is pretty helpful if you are going to spread the word throughout your company and probably have to deal with some project management which is not that progressive than others. I hope we could raise your interest in the dynamic Jenkins slave cloud. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them now. If you have any feedback or questions on our GitHub shares, don't hesitate to contact Klaus or me. Thank you for your attention. We are open for questions. Please. Yes. When a job is finished, uh, the the slave is actually in in idle state, and after some configurable um, idle minutes, uh, the Jenkins kills the slave and. Uh, sends the changed state to the Mesos cloud via the scheduler and Mesos then frees the resources and they are available again. A stale job? Uh, you mean if, if some um, uh, job executes indefinitely? Uh, you have to uh, terminate the slave uh, by yourself. So um, you can uh, do it with an uh, expiration time out of your slave or build some script of your own. But Mesos itself is completely unaware of uh, the kind of tasks it is running on. So uh, it doesn't actually know that there are Jenkins slaves executing or jobs within this slave, so it, it hasn't the possibility to do so. 
Mesos is completely unaware of, of the kind of tasks that is running. No. Uh, we actually did some additional work to the initial Jenkins Mesos plugin to ensure, to make sure that uh, the second we provision our slaves, uh, they get suspended. And after the job is finished, we hook, again, hook in again and kill them immediately. So uh, the resources are freed immediately and there is not a single chance that the slaves are reused for a second job. There was a question? Yes, uh, we, there is uh, in the cloud config user interface, you can configure actually pretty much everything or, or the most, for the most part of Docker. You can configure additional uh, port mappings, volumes, uh, parameters, and also uh, additional commands. And what we did is, uh, we packed everything together in some shell script, uh, which in turn executes an Ansible playbook, uh, which is different for the different kinds of slaves, so it matches the, the, the task for which the slave gets started. Yes, I think you, the, I think the, the answer for your question is, is a bit, uh, you can reuse one slave image for, for several labels. So you can um, configure different commands for the same slave image. You can configure different volumes for, the, uh, for, for one slave image, but different labels. A different label always means uh, a different configuration for your slave image. So you can uh, configure different la uh, volumes, different initial command, different uh, port mappings, different uh, resource uh, mappings, which are then allocated by the, uh, from the Mesos cloud. So you can configure your whole grid of combinations you want in different labels. Does it answer your question? Okay. Yes, uh, there is something like this. Uh, so uh, there are several mechanisms like this. So if you have a connectivity problem with your scheduler, which is the Jenkins uh, Mesos plugin, then you would see something uh, like um, uh, Jenkins always tries to re-register itself with the Mesos cloud. So it, it uh, on the Mesos side, it times out and it just kills the registration of the framework from the Jen Jenkins master. And Jenkins itself always tries to reconnect and reconnect. And you would see uh, terminated frameworks and uh, uh, retry tries from your Jenkins master until the connectivity is uh, back up again. No, the jobs are actually already running, would run just uh, as long as the network connectivity between the, the, the started Jenkins slave yeah. and the Jenkins master is agreed, this job is not affected no? if the connection between Jenkins master and Mesos master dies. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you for your attention.